Hi, and welcome to chapter 24, Other Property and Liability Insurance Coverages. So the ISO dwelling program. Now, some dwellings are ineligible for coverage under the homeowner's policy. So in these occasions, you can get insured under the ISL dwelling policy. Now, although a majority of homeowners are insured and use a homeowner's policy, like we discussed in the last two chapters, certain dwellings are ineligible for coverage under a homeowner's policy. Now, for example, if the home is not occupied by the owner, but is rented at, out to a tenant, the property is ineligible for homeowner's policy because the homeowner needs to live inside the home to get the policy approved. Uh, some property owners uh, do not need uh, a homeowner's property or they may want less costly or pricey option. So most of these homes can be insured under a dwelling policy drafted you know, by the insurance service office. So let's look at some of the different coverages and we'll, we'll talk about the basic form first and the basic form has parts um, A, B, C, and D and E that talk about different parts of coverage and a lot of this will be similar to the homeowners uh, insurance we covered in the last two chapters but the dwelling program is for anything else that uh, any other type of home you may live in but is not uh, going to be approved as a um, homeowner's uh, insurance. Okay, so let's just talk about uh, the basic coverage that these provide. So if we go under coverage A, and so it's going to insure the dwelling uh, in, in the policy, the materials and supplies located on or next to the location, um, and it's going to basically be to repair the dwelling and if there is damage to the dwelling. The, in part B, is going to look at structures set apart from the dwelling uh, by clear space, like a detached shed. Part C will cover personal property inside of the residence or the dwelling, usually up to 10% of the policy. Part D covers the fair rental value of if there's a loss um, and part of the dwelling is uninhabitable, um, then you can get uh, some money to cover the rent or the loss of rent, uh, it, you know, in the dwelling if the rental income is lost. Um, and finally, Part E uh, can be added to um, as an endorsement to the basic to provide coverage for additional living expenses. Now, only a limited number of named perils apply to both the dwelling and personal property, and all covered uh, property losses are paid with actual cash value basis with you know some exceptions. So some of the, let's just cover some of the basic uh, perils that will be covered by most of these dwelling policies, fire or lightning, Windstorm or hail, um, explosion, riot, aircraft vehicles, smoke, volcanic eruption, and vandalism onto the property. So let's look at the dwelling property two and dwelling property three, the broad form and the special form. Now, the broad form is going to provide coverage um, that's going to be more extensive than the basic form. So covered losses to the dwelling and other structures are indemnified on the basis of replacement costs rather than actual cash value, which is important because you want replacement costs so that way you can get the structure rebuilt. You know, the replacement cost provides, you know, are, they're similar to those found in the homeowner's contract and the broad form also covers and additional living expenses. So part E in the basic form is automatically included in the broad form. So that way, if you um, have to leave your dwelling to live somewhere else temporarily, they'll cover uh, part or all of that, that cost or rent. Now the broad form is also gonna include all the perils included in the basic form that we had just talked about, 
uh, plus extended coverage for wind, hail, smoke, and so on. And the following additional perils are going to be covered by the broad form, which are not covered by the basic form, which would be damaged by burglars, falling objects, uh, weight of ice, snow, or sleet, accidental discharge or overflow of water or stream, um, explosion, uh, no, explosions are covered. They're covered in the basic form and they're covered in the dwelling form. It's not, that's, explosions are covered in both. Um, freezing of the plumbing, heating, or air conditioning system, sudden and accidental tearing apart or cracking or burning or bulging of a steam or hot water heating or air conditioning system or sprinkler system, sudden and accidental damage from um, electrical current. And so these are just some things additional. So the broader form is basically very similar to the basic form, but it just has more bells and whistles in it. It's a little bit more comprehensive of the coverage. Now, dwelling property three is the special form. So this is going to provide um, the broadest coverage in the ISO dwelling program. So this is the most, of course, the most expensive form would be uh, dwelling property three, but it's going to be the have the most coverage in it. So as you move up from dwelling property one to three, it gets substantially more expensive and covers substantially more of uh, things that could go wrong. So the dwelling and the structures are insured against direct loss, you know, you know, in relationship to the property. So that means that, you know, the coverage is provided uh, on an open perils basis. So direct physical losses to dwelling and other structures are covered, except those losses that would be specifically excluded. So it's basically saying everything's covered. Instead of telling you in, in broad form or in the basic form, they give you a specific list of perils that are covered. In the special form, everything's covered except the list of exceptions. Uh, so that means it has a much broader coverage of things that could happen. Um, and it's just basically saying everything's covered except what would be specifically excluded, which is a lot more comprehensive than just giving you a list of 12 things that would be covered. So there could be things that happened that were unexpected and no one ever thought to put them in specifically in coverage. So the special form would cover that. Um, so all of the uh, perils from the uh, the broad and basic form are covered, uh, plus anything else. So there would really just be any spe uh, very specific exclusions would be written into the special form, and this would be an, uh, it depends on who's writing the insurance, and so there each contract would be different on exactly what would be excluded. Um, but you can also add endorsements to, to the special form. So there, of course, numerous endorsements can be added to, um, I guess you could actually add them to any of the dwelling forms, one, two, or three, and depending on the needs and desires of, of you uh, and your property. So most commonly added coverage would be theft and personal liability. So theft coverage is gonna be, you know, um, written in unlimited or broad, um, under an endorsement, but it's included in the special. So personal liability insurance is available by adding personal liability supplement to, to any of the policies. Um, and it'd be similar to liability coverage in the homeowner's policy. So again, these dwelling property insurance is not that common. And it would be, most people would fall into the, the, homeowner's insurance, this would be a special case. If you can't get homeowner's insurance, if your home doesn't qualify as a home, then it would have to fall into the special dwelling property, uh, which would be a rarity, but it's good to know they exist. Uh, also under the ISO program would be mobile home insurance. So you wouldn't use the dwelling programs for mobile homes. They have their own, you know, special insurance. Now, you would have to add, to get that mobile home insurance, you just would add an endorsement to the homeowners two or homeowners three policy discussed in um, chapter 22. So the mobile home must be, it has to meet some criteria as far as um, eligibility. So the eligibility of the mobile home must be at least 10 feet wide and 40 feet long and must be 
uh, designed for portability. So that means it must be able to be towed uh, on its own chassis and be able to move around. It's not a fixed structure. Now, and it also has to be designed for year-round living. So it's portable, it's mobile, it's year-round. There, it's you know it can be placed in the foundation, but needs to be able to be moved from location to location as needed to qualify as a mobile home coverage. So mobile home insurance, you know, it's an add-on to the homeowner's policy. So uh, because mobile homes have specific coverage related just to the mobile home. So the coverages in mobile homes, are, although they're similar to the homeowner's policy, there are major coverages, um, areas that are going to be covered. Here are just some of the highlights of what would be covered with a mobile home. Okay, so of course we have part A, which is going to be the dwelling, would be covered uh, and replacement cost of the dwelling. Part B would be the structures, and it's usually 10% of the coverage of part A. Um, the part C would be the unscheduled personal property. So here you would list the, your personal property with inside the mobile home, and it would be usually limited to 40% of the coverage in the, of the dwelling coverage in part A. Uh, part D is the loss of use. So if you can't live in your mobile uh, home for a period of time, there would be additional coverage to help um, pay for your rent somewhere else. Um, as far as additional coverages, this will pay up to $500 for cost incurred in transporting the mobile home to a safe place to avoid damage if it's endangered by a hurricane or a forest fire. I guess that's a real advantage of a mobile home. If, if there's an impending natural disaster coming that you have warning of, you can move your house. Um, and of course, there's also part uh, E and F, which would be personal liability coverage. Now, truth be told, most mobile homes, once they're situated, there's only usually one reason why they move, and that's because the landowner who owns the land asks you to move or raises the rent substantially. So if you do have a mobile home, it's best to always own the land underneath the mobile home. Otherwise, it's not much better than renting. So an inland marine floater. So many people have certain types of property that could be valuable. Um, electronic equipment, expensive jewelry, uh, goldware, silverware, um, fur coats that are moved from one location to another loca location. So you could have, maybe you have two homes, maybe you rent an apartment and own a home and you move this property between these locations. So this property would be insured, would, can be insured um, by, by an inland marine floater. So an inland marine floater is going to provide broad coverage on property frequently moved from one location to another. Um, with you know within certain time periods now some basic characteristics of these of these floater contracts you know they're not uniform but they have they are highly tailored to your specific needs but they do have some common characteristics as far as coverage is, is going to be tailored to a specific set of personal property to be insured so it really depends on the property you want to be insured and the value of that property the Desired amounts of insurance, you know, can be selected so you can kind of, you can, can select how much uh, insurance you want on each particular type of property. Some people might have valuable art collections or coin collections or stamp collections, so they would have to really determine what the value of that collection is to be insured. And it's always good that if you're going to insure something like a coin collection that you have pictures of the coin collections and then assessments of the value of the coins. So that way, when, if it is lost or stolen, you'll have an easier time collecting the, the cash value of that asset. You know, so broader, co coverage, broader coverage can be obtained. Um, you know, for example, a personal article floater insures uh, against direct physical loss, to, you know, to covered property, uh, direct physical loss, um, um, unless they want to specifically exclude certain items. So you can get a broader coverage just saying this, this floater is going to cover all my personal property. Uh, but then exceptions can be written into that, that they, that insurance does not feel like they want to cover or, or is too risky for them to cover. And this would generally, when you have this, this floater contract, it'll cover the, the property no matter where it is in the world. And it's pretty valuable for international travelers. Now, 
And, and generally these, these type of contracts have no deductible. So this would be a special circumstance for people who have very valuable property that travels with them on a routine uh, occasion. So let's talk about some personal article floaters, the PAF. So this coverage can be written as a standalone contract. Um, now these are gonna ensure certain classes of personal property as an open peril basis. It can be added as a schedule of uh, personal property endorsements to a homeowner's policy. So this personal article floater can, you know, either add it to an existing, I would say not to add it to existing homeowner's policy because this could provide, you know, additional uh, claims in the case of an event of loss of this property. It might be better to look into just having a individual standalone coverage and you can have this coverage in certain classifications. So instead of having a very broad coverage, which is very expensive, you can have a very narrow coverage just to cover the, the specific property that you're worried about. Because chances are you're not going to own a huge class of property that you're worried about, you, but you might be specifically worried about jewelry. So you may have a lot of expenses, expensive pieces of jewelry in your house, and that's something that you want to have special uh, additional insurance against. It could be special types of clothes, um, or furs. Furs can be quite expensive. Camera equipment. Camera equipment can run into thousands of dollars, especially if it's you know used for business purposes or advanced for, for personal photography photography purposes. Uh, or if you have um, a hobby of maybe filming movies, you can have a lot of expensive equipment. So you might have a separate contract for that. If somebody is a musician or, or, or um, they may have a lot of expensive musical instruments that could be have a, should have their own special policy. Silverware, some people own very antique and expensive silverware. Uh, there could be contracts just for golf equipment. Golf equipment can be pretty extensive and expensive. Uh, fine art, people who collect fine art may need special um, insurance for that. And also um, special types of collections, coin, stamp, comic book collections. Uh, these can have uh, special insurance where these typically in a, in, a, in a dwelling or a homeowners association type of insurance, they don't really know how to handle um, compensation for special types of, of collections. So it'd be better to get a separate collector's insurance as a PAF, personal article floater, to protect these types of assets. Now, this personal property, the best way to protect it is when you get the insurance, you want to contact the insurance company and say, what type of records do you require up you know in case the the assets or the articles are damaged or sold, stolen or lost so you would want to know exactly in what circumstances do you would you get uh, compensated for for your assets and specifically what would they need receipts visual confirmation of the assets um, so i would say that the best type of insurance would be one where before the insurance is actually signed, you can document and verify all of, say, the, the rare coins you have or the rare stamps or the rare common books you have, have them graded visually, you know, inspected, putting up with a certain grade of, of um, quality um, on the collectability, and then have that documented within the policy to say, okay, so here, here are the... Um, the items that are the most valuable that I want insured and here's proof of the quality and proof of my ownership. So that way, if they are ever, is there ever a problem with them, they can easily be compensated for because everything would be in place. Okay, let's move on to uh, watercraft insurance. So of course, if you live, most Americans live by the coast and you know, most Americans feel like they would like to have um, a boat. So it's a pretty common pastime to have some sort of watercraft. And a lot of Americans uh, operate boats for pleasure, recreation, and these boats can be quite expensive. You know, um, it's not uncommon for a sailboat or for a motorboat to be worth $100,000 or more. Now, the homeowner's policy provides only limited coverage for boats. So it's really not, the homeowner's policy is really not meant to adequately compensate for damages or losses on a boat or watercraft. Um, and oftentimes the, uh, the coverage is limited, very small amount of coverage and direct loss that may only be covered for certain types of events um, that the boat or, or the boat may 
wind up being in. So you have to really um, think about where the, you know, a couple things about what type of boat you have, where it's stored, you know, what's the value of the boat to decide whether or not you need more comprehensive uh, coverage for the boat. Now, because um, a boat owner, you know, the boats are very expensive and it, they can easily be damaged by a storm, a hurricane, um, freak waves, uh, and other things that could, you know, happen to a boat. So a, a boat owner's package is probably a pretty good thing to have. Now, one thing that's common to these boat owner packages is, you know, physical damage coverage. So there's going to be coverage for any physical damage that's going to occur to the boat, which is going to result in some sort of direct loss. Um, and so these damages, um, if the boat collides with another boat, which is common, if the boat gets stranded on, a, on an island or a reef, if the boat crashes into the dock, if you know there are heavy winds and the boat sustains damage due to these winds and there's tears in the sails or deterioration or problems with the mechanical side of the boat, these are all things that could be uh, covered by the physical damage. Now you would also get a liability coverage. So this is going to ensure um, property, you know, make sure you have coverage for property damage and bodily liability um, that arise out of neglect, you know, about the owner's negligence um, or oper you know, how they operate the boat. Now, for example, you know, if an operator damages another boat or winds up, you know, speeding past a boat and creating a wave that, that overturns another boat and accidentally injures some swimmers maybe and they, they, they motorboat by too quickly and hit some swimmers. Um, so these are things that you would want liability coverage in case your boat winds up damaging somebody's property or damaging somebody's person. So that's what the liability coverage would have. You know, it's a very, uh, probably more important to have this liability coverage than even the, the damage coverage because, you know, somebody else is injured, their property or themselves are injured, they're likely to sue you for that, for recovery. So it's very good to have this liability. Because if, you know, if you have the boat, say you have just a $20,000 boat and that, you know, and you lose that boat, the most you can lose is 20000 So the damage coverage policy is nice to cover that 20000 but that's the most you could lose. The liability coverage, you could lose an unlimited amount of liability depending on how, what type of event your boat is involved in. So it's always good to have more generous liability insurance on the boat than physical damage coverage. Now you can also have medical expense coverage. And this is going to be coverage that if they, this is typical to what you might see in an automobile and this coverage is going to be necessary in case there's any medical um, situations occur while on the boat or people leaving the boat or getting on the boat, falling on the boat, falling off the boat, um, getting an injury. Maybe the boat jerks somehow or they're water skiing off the back of the boat. So this medical coverage is, is definitely good for you and your passengers. Now, if you're lucky enough to be rich enough to buy a yacht, what's the difference between a boat and a yacht? Oh, about a million dollars, I would say. So, but in reality, they would look at a yacht if it's, you know, um, depending on the size is really what, you know, would this would be classified as a yacht. So they're just more valuable boats. And typically, you know, sailboats are 26 feet in length. Um, these are just bigger boats, more expensive boats. So there's a separate set of insurance for yacht insurance. Now this is going to be again you're going to have your your property damage uh, insurance, which is going to cover the you know the hull and the boat uh, and any damage um, from operating the boat from just the, the property of the boat. Um, so this is you know again in all these policies some things can be explicitly excluded, so you have to really know exactly what's covered, what's not covered. So um, but since boats are very expensive, you want to have this damage, uh, sorry, yachts are very expensive. You want to definitely have this damage coverage uh, in case of anything can occur that could, you know, really uh, damage the boat. And including liability coverage is equally important because you tend to have more people on a yacht than a regular boat. So the more people, the more chances of something occurring. So having this liability insurance for your, your passengers, as well as any damage that your yacht is bigger, heavier, and likely to cause more damage to other people's property or person. So liability insurance is unnecessary. And of course you would get your um, 
medical coverage payment. And then their other coverages could be added to um, this yacht insurance. You know, if, you know, um, you know, depending on the insurance agent, you know, you can extend it to include uh, your personal property on the boat, um, fishing gear, sport equipment. Um, but typically you can't cover things like money, jewelry, and other really expensive like valuables that you would need a um, individual coverage for. And probably would be better with some of the coverage we talked about earlier with the per personal article floater for that um, type of additional coverage. Now, let's talk about government property insurance programs. So government insurance programs are, they're often necessary for certain perils that are difficult for, um, to insure privately and coverage is not available or affordable because the premiums are just out of control. So basically what we're talking about here is a situation where something is likely to occur and it's going to be very expensive if it does occur. And the most common thing I would say would be flood insurance. So if you are in a state, say Texas or Florida, which is very common and prone to flooding, uh, you may have no choice but to, to, to be the only option to get flood insurance would be the um, National Flood Insurance Program. And so uh, buildings, if you have a building that's going to be in a, in a commonly flooded area um, and it's going to be, you know, something that you can't insure with private insurance, uh, you know, so you're going to want to get this national flood insurance because, you know, <clears throat> certain, you know, if you live in an area where rivers type to overflow or you live below sea level and your house can be completely destroyed, you definitely want to have this flood insurance to protect your asset. Now, um, this flood insurance is going to be purchased from agents or brokers who are going to represent um, the national flood program. The... Under the Write Your Own program, private insurers will sell federal flood insurance under their own names, collect premiums, and receive expense allowances. So basically, the government's responsible for underwriting the losses, but they use private insurers to actually facilitate the paperwork, the administration, and the record keeping of the policies. And this helps um, the federal government to save money because they don't have to really do any of the paperwork or any setup and they'll give a small allowance to these insurance companies to write these policies uh, for the government. Now, the program is administered by FEMA, which is the federal arm that, that deals with their emergencies. So they're the ones who, who particularly will uh, fund this type of flood insurance. Now, the program was, of course, going to be designed to be self-supporting for the average historical loss. So these government insurance programs aren't made to make money for the government. So the government's not trying to make a profit here. What they're trying to do is create uh, a pretty uh, zero-sum um, game here with, the, with their flood insurance premiums. So they want to collect, the goal is to collect enough premiums to pay for what they expect the losses will be that year. Um, some of the problems is they never really accurately forecast what the losses can be. So the program typically runs a deficit. And it's because there could be years where there are some floods that could be five times the, the, uh, the annual average. So Congress has extended the program uh, for five years in 2012 and again in 2014 um, and again in 2018. So the government has to, Congress has to constantly look at this and reapprove it because it's money that the government's going to be responsible for. And the federal law requires individuals to purchase flood insurance if they have federal uh, guaranteed financing to buy, rebuild, or repair structures located in the flood area. So if you if you have some sort of federally subsidized mortgage or supported mortgage, you're going to be required to get this flood insurance because, you know, if the flood, if the federal government's already guaranteeing your mortgage, they might as well um, require you have this flood insurance to protect their asset. Okay. Now, buildings and their contents can be covered by the flood insurance if the community agrees and adopts to enforce sound flood control and land management uses. So basically, um, 
there's going to be a map that would have the flood hazard areas and then the um, the residents can purchase a limited amount of insurance to subsidize rates uh, under some more emergency pro, um, portion program. So it's basically to provide insurance that people otherwise would normally able to afford themselves. But the community has to take on, you know, um, reasonable amount of investment in levies and in, in pumps and stuff to um, alleviate the risks of flooding. So let's talk about how a flood, um, how you define a flood. So uh, the definition of flood um, in the standard flood insurance policy is going to be this. So I'm just going to read this statement. This is, you know, a general and temporary condition of partial or complete inundation of two or more acres of, of normally dry area, land area, or two or more properties, at least one of which is your property, from overflowing of inland or tidal waters, from unusual and rapid accumulation, runoff or surface waters from any surface or from mud flow. So that's how they would define a flood. And there's a 30 day warning, uh, waiting period for new applicants endorsements for flood coverage. So basically what they're saying with this 30 day waiting period is, you know, the hurricanes coming in two days and you can't just jump on, get the flood insurance two days before the hurricane comes. And then after the hurricane leaves, cancel the flood insurance and try to, you know, um, outsmart the system by only getting the coverage when it's most likely to flood. Or, you know, in some cases there may be a season of flooding. So people might pick up the uh, insurance a month before the season starts and cancel the insurance a month after the season to save half a year of premiums. So they don't want you doing that. Okay, so maximum amounts of federal f uh, flood insurance available under the emergency and regular program. So we have the emergency program and then the regular program, depending on where you live in the flood coded areas. So this would be the the uh, higher limits uh, building covered, um, coverage of these programs. And there would be additional um, limits depending if you are uh, in different states uh, if it was a high cost state. So there are some exceptions to this, but this is basically the coverage between the two programs. So you see that, you know, um, the coverage really isn't going to be for most, most places aren't going to be a full replacement of your house. So if your house gets swept away, it may not be a full replacement cost, but at least it's something. And most flood damage does less damage than, you know, $50,000 to most structures, depending, it's always depending on a bunch of things. All right. So let's look at the flood insurance that's available in three standard policies. We have the dwelling form, the general property form, and the residential condominium uh, building association form. So the dwelling form is to ensure one, or one to four family residential buildings, single family dwelling units in a condominium, condominium building. Uh, so homeowners can ensure the dwelling uh, and or schedule their personal property under um, this form and renters can also insure their personal property in this form as well. So that's just a basic dwelling form. Now, if you have the general property policy form, this is used to insure five or more family building residents. Um, uh, so examples would include hotels or motels, apartment buildings, uh, things of this, this nature, even, even shops and the restaurants can be covered. Now the residential condominium building association policy is issued to of course, condos or condo associations on behalf of its unit owners. So this would be the, you know, the condo uh, homeowners association basically saying we have a hundred condo units. We're going to buy the policy for everybody under this. And so they could be broken up in, in that particular way. So what is covered by flood insurance and what's not covered by flood insurance? So let's see here say most everything is going to be covered in your flood insurance. Um, you now, one thing to be careful of is sewer backup. That's only going to be covered if there's a, the result of flooding, not some other reason for causing the sewer backup. Um, so here we're, you know, let's just look at some things that, okay, so here's a better slide of what flood insurance is going to cover. So 
the building, the foundation, the electrical, the plumbing systems, the air conditioning, the equipment, the fences, heaters, refrigerators, stoves, appliances, carpeting, uh, flooring, um, which is probably the thing that would be damaged the most likely is your flooring. If your house is flooded by one or two feet of water and you have no basement, your flooring is definitely going to be ruined. Um, also, uh, bookcases, cabinets, paneling, sheetrock, uh, windows, uh, window treatments, detached garages. Uh, these are all things that would be uh, covered, insured under flood insurance. Continuing things that are coverage under personal property would be personal belongings such as clothing, furniture, electronic equipment, curtains, portable air conditioners, the ones that go in the windows, or the ones that can be inside the house and vented outside the house, uh, portable microwave ovens, portable dishwashers, carpets not included in the building coverage, uh, washers and dryers, freezers, with and uh, the food inside of them and certain other valuable um uh, valuables such as artwork and furs now again you need to the best way to get uh your money in case these things are damaged is to have receipts and pictures of the items in original condition okay things that are not insured by either property uh, or personal coverage in the flood insurance are going to be damage caused by moisture, mildew, mildew, or mold that can be avoided by taking the proper steps as an owner to ensure that the humidity levels and the water in your house is um, taken care of properly. Currency, precious metals, or valuable papers will not be covered. Property and belongings outside of the home will not be covered. Living expenses such as temporary housing will not be covered. Uh, financial losses uh, caused by business interruption uh, and any type of self-propelled vehicles such as cars um, and their parts will not be covered. However, even though flood insurance won't cover these things, your homeowners or your dwelling property insurance may still cover them um, based on other circumstances. And that's one of the reasons it's not covered under the the flood insurance. Um, now let's look at uh, government property insurance programs. And continuing, the federal flood insurance program faces several problems, of course. Now, there's been a huge deficit ever since Hurricane Katrina in 2005, where there was, you know, just massive flooding and damage occurred uh, and substantial uh, losses uh, occurred to this flood insurance program, which is going to hurt the sustainability of the program in the future unless Congress awards more funds to shore up this flood insurance. Um, many of the property owners who have the flood insurance do not pay the premiums um, that, that are going to match the risk of the flooding. So their premiums that they pay are not they're not as efficient in setting the premiums in relationship to the risks faced. So that is another reason for a deficit or the insolvency of the program. And because the programs are required to ensure um, properties that may have had losses previously and the high risk properties, they still have to insure them, even though they're likely to be uh, file claims again in the future. And these are properties that could be, you know, they could be in the, an easily flooded zone. They could be on the shore near uh, um, where water routinely every every once or twice a year is going to flood the property, things of this nature, uh, which, you know, makes the uh, the program bleed even more money. Okay. As well as just some, you know, as all insurance, there's some uh, a huge amount of corruption and fraud involved that also wind up wasting millions of dollars in the program. Now, if we go back to the Bigger Waters Act of 2012 and extended the, this extended the flood insurance program through 2017. So some key provisions that were made inside the act was the rate subsidies on certain properties are phased out over four years. So these subsidies will help keep some insurance more affordable in the flood insurance program. Annual premium rates uh, increase up to 20% are allowed depending on 
the circumstances of the flood areas. So these, these two things are critical to maintaining the solvency of the, the National Flood Insurance Program, that they're allowed to raise premiums in areas or properties that are aggressively utilizing the flood insurance, and they can phase out subs subsidiaries on some of the flood insurance um, over a four-year period. And that's to make it so it's not sort of like all of a sudden your flood insurance triples. Um, it gives you uh, a stepped increase over a four-year period. Um, now, the premium-related provisions of the Act were rescinded in 2014 for the passage of the Homeowners Flood Insurance Act, and the premiums were capped at an 18% increase. So sort of, you know, there's a thing with the, since Congress is involved in this insurance, uh, every time it revises or changes the law, there's new um, things that they, the people insured have to worry about. Uh, now, Congress routinely uh, delays extending the program uh, and then sometimes extends it late or retroactively. And the program is already facing a deficit of more than $8 billion, uh, by 2017. So Congress, you know, um, has to act every so often to reset the program and re-outline the program to keep it solvent. Now, the uh, flood insurance started reinsurance program in 2016 and expanded in 2017, but for 2018, 1.5 billion of the risk was shifted to reinsurers, uh, and the additional risk was shifted to the capital markets by uh, these catastrophe bonds. So there's been they've been playing with some additional models. So that the reinsurance market just means like there is a a new market involved and the risk is going to be uh, put on those reinsurers utilizing the federal flood insurance to uh, reinsure the how the resale and reinsure the people who have the flood insurance and then try to um, repackage those those um, risks in these uh, um, these bonds to be sold on Wall Street at higher interest rates. So basically, the Fed is trying to utilize other measures to help pay for this national flood insurance. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, FAIR plan, FAIR access and insurance requirements. So this is something that was created way back in the 60s, and it's a way to provide coverage to urban property owners who are unable to obtain coverage through the standardized market. So the plan is going to cover property for fire and extended coverage, vandalism, um, and, and other related uh, mischief and perils. And the building insured under the FAR plan must meet certain underwriting standards. Um, so a state with a FAR plan creates a pool of syndicated private insurers to provide basic property insurance. So again, this is a way to extend insurance to, to people who may not be able to afford it in areas um, especially urban areas or city-like areas, you know, and during the 60s, there were a lot of riots in cities and that resulted in a lot of property damage. And even today, we see riots occurring where there's extensive property damage. So many property owners in these riot-prone areas are unable to obtain normal property insurance at affordable rates. So that's where this FAR plan comes in to effect, and it's a way of being able to insure these urban properties that are in the riskier area for things like riots and vandalism. Uh, and each state has a plan or a pool that they're gonna syndicate um, for the purposes of this type of insurance. And it's again, for people who can't obtain insurance through normal standard markets, meaning that insurers know it's such a high risk they don't wanna sell. These pools of syndicates help, um, which are help in operations by private insurers to do, you know, again, run the administration, the paperwork of it, you know, each insurer in the pool or syndicate is assessed in an appropriate share of loss and expenses based on the proportion of property uh, insured premiums within the state. So that they're basically taking a percentage of these properties in these areas. And the FAR plan premiums are higher than premiums paid in standard market. However, the basic insurance is made available where coverage otherwise would not exist. So these, it's not always that it's so inexpensive, it's just that there's nobody else to cover who will give you a, a policy in that area. And you know all these plans are gonna cover fire and vandalism and riot and windstorms and uh, things are typically liable to happen in these areas. Now, the four plans have been established in 32 states and the District of Columbia, and several states have beach and windstorm plans where properties 
you know, vulnerable to damage from severe windstorms and hurricanes. They can't normally get coverage for this, uh, especially in coastal areas where hurricanes are prominent. They can get this far plan. So two states established, two states established companies to write coverage. Um, at the end of the year of 2016, Florida Citizens Property Insurance Company had uh, over 500,000 policies in force, and the Louisiana Property Insurance Corporation had over 80,000 policies in force. And these, these are two areas that are very much prone to hurricane and flooding and damage from, you know, severe weather. So the, now before building it is insured under a FAR plan, it has to meet certain underwriting standards. So if these standards are met, the policy is issued. If the building is substandard, the, the property owner has to make improvements to reduce the risk of fire, theft, water damage, and you know, upgrade electrical wiring, heating, and heating and plumbing systems, repair the roof, improve some security measures, security cameras and alarms. Uh, if the you know, so if the property owner does not correct these conditions, then the home is going to be prone. The home or business is going to be prone to losses because uh, the the far plan is not going to cover you know properties that are substandard. Um, and likely to have high insurance costs. Okay, now let's talk about title insurance. So title insurance is gonna protect an owner uh, of property and or the lender of money for the purchase of that property, like a bank with a mortgage, uh, against any unknown defects in the title to the, the property under consideration. So a defect to a, to a title, basically what you want is a title to be clear of any, any type of entanglements. Um, so defects to a clear title can result from an invalid, uh, invalid will, incorrect description of the property, defective probate of the will, undisclosed, undisclosed liens against the property, encasements, numerous other legal uh, defects can occur and sometimes um, can be attached to the title. So without a clear title, the owner could lose the property to someone with a superior claim or incur losses because of unknown lien or unmarketable um, ability uh, of the title and, you know, uh, plus attorney expenses. So title insurance is designed to protect against these types of losses. So any type of, you know, if you have an asset like a property, liens uh, can be attached. So there can be, you know, any number of liens against the property. There could be you know, possibly there's past taxes owed to a property, other encumbrances that are going to, you know, make the uh, ownership of the property difficult. So the information about what is attached to the par property should be recorded in a legal document known as an abstract. And the history of the ownership and the title of the property should all be in an abstract. So when the real estate is purchased, the purchaser can hire an attorney to search the abstract to determine whether there are any defects to the clear title of the property. You know, but the purchaser is not fully protected by this method. Mistakes can happen, things can be missed, things can be misfiled temporarily or take time to be attached to the title because there may be, you know, some unknown lien or encumbrance that is just not recorded in the abstract and that's possible. So the owner or the lender, you know, could still incur a loss despite being diligent and trying to protect and search the title for any type of encumbrances. So to guarantee, you know, a stronger guarantee uh, is needed in to protect you against these losses. And title insurance is what's going to, you know, provide that guarantee. So the title insurance policies have certain characteristics that can distinguish themselves from other policies. Um, now, so here are this, here here are some of the things that we should talk about. The the policy provides protection against title defects that have occurred in the past prior to the effective date of the policy. So anything that happens in the future, you have to settle because it's probably going to be related to something you did, but things in the past is what it covers. You know, the policy um, is written by the insurer based on the assumption that no losses will occur and any known title uh, defects or facts that have a bearing on the title are listed in the policy or excluded from coverage. So if there's anything that is known and is listed that you don't clear up, the title insurance is not going to protect you against. So the premium, so that's why you want to make sure before you buy the house, all those things are cleared up and removed from the title. And then you get the title insurance, then this will protect you from anything unknown that may pop up. So the premiums 
uh, is, is paid only once when the policy is issued and no additional premiums are required after you get the insurance. The policy term is going to run indefinitely into the future as long as the title defects occur before the date the policy was uh, written and any insured losses is covered no matter when it's discovered in the future. So basically it has to, it can be discovered in the future, but it has to be originated in the past before the policy is um, established. And if a loss occurs, the insured is indemnified uh, in the dollar amounts up to the policy limits. So the policy is not going to guarantee unlimited coverage. There's going to be certain levels of, of protection uh, to uh, however the amount of money is going to be placed in the policy. Now, there are some defects um, when you're talking about title insurance that you should be aware of. A homeowner's homeowner, um, you know, if you do not shop around for title insurance, it, you, if you select it by the um, suggestion of the real estate agent or the closing institution, um, it's going to be included in the closing costs. However, you know, you really don't get a chance to shop around to get the best deal or the best coverage in most cases. So home buyers are overcharged for title insurance. Several studies you know, have alleged that consumers pay more for coverage uh, than the fair price of the insurance. So it's sort of kind of a little bit of a scam here, you know, because you're, you're definitely, you know, I, I've definitely had to pay for title insurance in the past, but it all comes in part of the transaction of the closing settlement of the property. So you really never get a chance to even see the, the, the title insurance or get an idea of what you're covered for or what it's, you know, it's just all big mystery. So people, it's a good prime place where you could be, they can overcharge you for things because no one's really looking. Um, now the title insurance market is flawed as the title insurance, you know, spend money to uh, induce the real estate agents, mortgage and, and lenders and brokers and homeowners to steer home purchases, specific title agents and companies driving the cost of the coverage up. So again, you know, it's almost like there's kickbacks or there's, you know, some favoritism here and you're not getting the coverage, the best price, best coverage, you're getting what is most convenient or profitable for these other agents. So although illegal kickbacks in real, to real estate agents and lenders and builders are widespread. So yeah, it's not legal to do this, but it's a pretty common occurrence that one hand washes the other in this area. Okay, so let's look at personal umbrella policies. So a personal umbrella policy is something that's going to be a catch-all. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, some some four claims that are going to be at a catastrophic level judgment or lawsuit that have a chance to wipe you out. So if someone uh, is going to sue you for a multi-million dollar lawsuit, unless you have an umbrella policy, if you lose that lawsuit, you're losing everything you own. So... Uh, so certain minimums amount of amounts of liability insurance must be carried on the underlying contracts. Coverage is going to be broad and include protection against certain losses not covered by other underlying insurance contracts. And self-insured retention must be satisfied for losses covered by the umbrella policy, but not by any other contract. So these umbrella policies, they're going to be they're really for, you know, excessive liability. It's an excessive liability insurance you most likely aren't, aren't going to need. So it's going to be a broad coverage. And, you know, you want this umbrella policy to provide coverage in case of an extreme type of lawsuit with, dealing with very large amounts of money. So the broad, the broad policy is going to, you know, protect you, uh, personal liability and loss exposure. Um, that's going to cover bodily injury, property damage liability and other personal uh, injury. So you have, if you have other insurance, auto insurance, home insurance, these things must kick in first and cover what they're gonna cover and the umbrella policy come in, comes in later. Now, it's typical of a self-insured retention or de a deductible. So the self-insured retention or, or deductible applies only to losses covered by the umbrella policy, but not by any underlying contract. So the self, um, Insured retention is typically $250, but can be higher. So examples of claims not covered by the underlying contracts, but insured under an umbrella policy include libel, slander, defamation of character, you know, things of this nature. 
Um, so you might have in the million dollar personal umbrella policy, you might have an auto insurance policy, and you may have a home insurance policy. Now, if someone, if you have an accident and someone's going to sue you as being a, a negligent motorist, and they can sue you for a million dollars, first your auto policy is going to pay um, the damages first, and then your umbrella policy will kick in to pay the remainder of it. Now, the umbrella, the umbrella policy is actually pretty reasonably priced. It's really not that expensive because it's so unlikely that you're going to use it. Um, so the actual cost is going to depend exactly on, on how much property you own, how much insurance of the umbrella policy you're going to have, uh, and other factors. But typically, the umbrella policy is pretty, pretty reasonable to obtain. Um, okay. Okay, so typical uh, underwriting coverage amounts required to qualify for personal on, on, on an umbrella policy is that you have to have um, your auto coverage should be 250, 550, personal liability 100 or, or 300,000, and watercraft of 500,000, which would be the typical required coverage. Now, the when we talk about the uh, ISO, so the, which is the insurance service office, they um, they've revised several times the umbrella policy, personal umbrella policy rules. Last time it was revised is in 2014, um, and it's designed, you know, to look at certain characteristics. So the policy pays for damages in excess of retain limits for bodily injury, property damage, or personal injury uh, for which the insured is legally liable. The policy covers some uh, additional expenses, including legal and defense costs, and exclusions include uh, liability for expected or intentional injury, uh, certain personal uh, injury losses, business liability, and professional services, which you should have separate insurance for. Umbrella policy should cover the person named uh, their spouse and any residents of the same household should be involved and covered under the same policy. The residential re uh, relatives, including wards of the state and foster children, should be covered under your umbrella policy. Household residents younger than 21 years of age under the care of the homeowner, of sorry, of the policy owner, such as a foreign exchange student, as an example. Any person using an auto, rec recreational, or watercraft that is owned by you as the policyholder is covered under the umbrella policy. Any person or organization legally responsible for acts or omissions of names, insured, or family members while using an auto or recreational vehicle um, should be covered. Any persons or organizations legally responsible for animals owned by you, the, um, the insured, or family member um, should be covered as well. So there could be exclusions under this as well, some things that are excluded. Um, like we were talking about before these exclusions here, let me just go into them in a little bit more detail. So anything that's expected intentional. So if you intentionally cause damage or hurt yourself, or you're expected to be hurt um, in some sort of action you're taking, these are not going to be covered because these are preventable. Um, certain personal injury losses, a person, you know, a policy excludes coverage for certain um, losses arising f out of material publications before the beginning of the policy um, that would be uh, a fraud or a criminal act committed um, by the insured, um, the rental of the premises. So typically if you're going to rent the premises, um, the rental people are not going to be included under your policy. Any business liability or professional services will not be covered under the umbrella policy, which I mentioned before, which should have its own separate insurance. Aircraft um, will not be covered. Um, vehicles used for racing would not be covered, such as racing cars, racing boats, communicable diseases, um, sexual assault, uh, possession of drugs, dealing of drugs. These are not covered. So these, so it's not, it's not going to cover every situation in your life. But by and large, if you are law abiding and you follow, you know you know, uh, a decent, reasonable conduct, the, umbre the umbrella policy should protect you well. Okay, so that's it for chapter 24. I hope you enjoyed this series 
of insurance lectures and risk management lectures. And I wish you well in the future. And remember to design your insurance policies around your needs to keep you safe from any future losses.